Earth Defense Force 5 is a 1 to 4 player co op horde shooter where you defend the Earth from an overwhelming alien invasion. What makes CDF special is the uniqueness of its four playable classes, the amount of destruction those classes can unleash, the absurd number of enemies on the field at once, and its mission based story structure, which develops the overarching plot, reveals new enemies, and makes it clear in each mission with both its story and its gameplay that humanity is probably going to lose. Let's start with the game's premise. You are a civilian doing some work on an EDF base. Depending on your class, you're either a security guard or a construction worker or an engineer. The point being that you're just some guy, you're not part of the military. The base gets attacked by giant insects and you need to make your way out. You meet the sergeant and his team who promise to get you to safety. You fight through the underground portion of the base and make it to the surface where you hope to rendezvous with the ground forces. And that's the end of mission one. Mission 2 begins as soon as you make it to the surface. As soon as you exit, you see that the ground forces are already engaged with more giant insects, and the sky is covered in flying saucers. Here you get your first tiny taste of how many enemies the game intends to put on the screen at once. It also introduces how a lot of these individual missions have a kind of small story attached to them. In this mission, they can't get their armored exoskeletons working, and so you need to protect them while they try and turn them on. You fight waves of insects, with the last wave being much bigger than the others and coming from multiple directions at once. Just before the insects reach the base, the music shifts, the exoskeletons come online, and together you fight them back, ending the second mission. The third mission happens immediately after. A giant pylon descends from the sky, destroying the two mechs that saved you in the last mission, and the pylon then begins teleporting insects. After you destroy that first pylon, you see dozens being launched across the sky. Now throughout all these missions while this is going on, the NPCs will engage in radio chatter with each other. They'll speculate on what's going on and who's responsible. They share rumors and information that they got from relatives in other countries, and you'll even get to hear news station reports letting you know what kind of information the public is working with. So anyway, you're listening to this radio chatter while you're destroying the pylons that are landing on the base. And just as you finish off the last of them... This base won't make it! Abandon the base! Evacuate now! We need to evacuate! Come with me! Take you to somewhere safe! You're forced to retreat. This right here, this moment where countless pylons crash down around you just as you were getting your bearings, is the atmosphere that EDF is trying to engender. The whole game is just this, iterated in different ways. The missions have phases like the ones I've described. It's often the case that you go in with one objective, and by the end of the mission you have a completely different one. It's not unusual that during a mission something completely over the top happens, shifting your context for the mission and realigning your goals. And while you do this, you're continuously listening to radio chatter that grounds you in what you're doing right now, and elaborates what's happening in the broader narrative. There are over a hundred missions that continue the story, and despite that it's rarely boring, the game does a good job of keeping the missions fresh. They'll do that by introducing a new enemy type into the missions, or the missions themselves will be unique. Alright, let's talk about the classes. We'll begin with the Ranger. The Ranger's the default class, and he serves as a kind of jack-of-all-traits. His weapons are assault rifles, shotguns, sniper rifles, rocket launchers, missile launchers, grenades, flamethrowers, C4 explosives, claymores, anti-air claymores, and the reverser guns which are support weapons that let you heal yourself and your allies. The ranger's gimmick is that he has armor that increases his walk and his sprint speed. The different armor suits will have different specialties, and they'll often mix and match various benefits to different degrees, so you'll have to pick what you want. All of the protector type armor will increase the walk and sprint speed, but the ones with hybrid in the name will also give the ranger the ability to destroy obstacles by running into them, in the same way he destroys them by rolling into them. Some armor will reduce the movement penalty when you take a hit. Others will focus entirely on the sprint enhancement and offer no improvement to the walk speed. The thing about the ranger is that he's reliable. He always has a solution for any given problem in a mission. If a mission has a lot of bugs that swarm you, you got shotguns. If a mission has a lot of flying saucers or pylons, he can switch to sniper rifles and rocket launchers. If there's a lot of flying enemies, then he can use missile launchers to track them. He always has a way to be effective. The issue with him is that he's a lot less effective than any other class. 
Though the variety of his weapons is impressive, he can only equip two at a time. And those weapons, in general, are weaker than what the other classes have available. Now let's contrast him with another class, the Air Raider. The Air Raider has no mobility. Like the Ranger, he can dodge attacks by rolling left or right. But unlike the Ranger, he has no ability to sprint. He has no equipment that will improve his walk speed, nor any other equipment that can reduce the bugs slowing him down when he gets hit, which makes him the easiest to overrun and kill. Now the Air Raider's gimmick is that he's more like a targeting device, and many of the weapons he can equip are not on his person. He just tells the gunships and the bombers and the artillery bases where to strike. And so his different weapons have different ways of reloading. He has a few normal-ish weapons like the limpet guns, which shoots out a little explosive that sticks to enemies and you can detonate it at any time. These weapons are reloaded normally by having them equipped. But for the most part, you'd only use weapons like these if you're forced to because you're doing an underground mission where you don't have access to your full range of airstrikes. The more common weapons are the ones that reload on their own, whether or not you're currently using them. For example, the gunship category of weapons has you fire off a beacon, and that area will be targeted by a corresponding cannon shot. There's a lot of different cannon types, so there's usually a beacon that will correspond to your needs. The autocannons will target the beacon and fire with a prolonged burst. The 120mm cannon fires essentially a downward-aimed shotgun blast. The 150mm cannon fires a single powerful explosive, and both of those last two can be fired in succession, allowing you to almost use it like a normal gun. Now because you're essentially just telling a gunship where to fire, the reloading is done automatically. The Air Raider can hold up to three weapons, so if he wants to, he can fire off a beacon, switch to the next weapon, fire off that beacon, switch to the next weapon, fire off those beacons, and by the time he gets to the first weapon, it should be reloaded. The other weapons that he has that automatically reload are the bulge lasers and the cruise missiles, both of which are guided by a laser. Both the satellite laser and the cruise missiles will crash down wherever that laser is pointed, which means if you're pointing that beacon at a distant group of enemies and an ally walks between you and them, those missiles will change direction mid-flight to go to where that beacon last pointed. It's very easy to accidentally kill yourself and your teammates when you're playing as an air raider. If you drop an airstrike directly atop one of your allies, they might complain, but what do they know? They're not the air raider, you are. You have a wider view of the battlefield, you know better. They have the mobility to get out of the way of your airstrikes. And if you're putting an airstrike there, that's because that's where it needs to be. Now the last type of weapon that the air raider has available is weapons that are reloaded with credits. The air raider's vehicles and his most powerful airstrikes work off of this system. At the start of the mission, the Air Raider has access to these strikes, but once he's used them, he needs to replenish his credits to use them again. You gain credits by killing enemies with different enemy types being worth different amounts of credits. It doesn't tell you how much each enemy is worth, but it does show a progress bar for each of your airstrikes, giving you a rough estimate of how many more you need to kill before you can use this Air Raid again. These Air Raids can accrue points the moment that they're used. That means it can earn reload credits by the kills that it gets. So, for example, if you call Heavy Bomber Phobos to do an airstrike on a target-rich environment, it's very possible to kill enough enemy monsters with that run to be able to summon Phobos again. You can't summon that same strike again, even if it's fully reloaded, until the current strike is over. But it will be ready and usable immediately after. Now, if you're playing in multiplayer, your kills aren't the only kills that will replenish your strikes. Everybody's kills will replenish your strikes whether they come from co-op allies or NPC allies. Artillery based strikes require you to throw a smoke grenade for the artillery base to target and can fire mortar, howitzer, or cannon based artillery. Howitzer strikes deal low damage but have a huge splash radius. Mortar type artillery does more damage than the howitzer and also has a lower credit requirement to reload. But the blasts also have a smaller radius, often missing targets. The cannon strikes, on the other hand, will fire double the number of shots, and each one of those shots do high damage, but the strike is much more focused, and each one of the blasts has a much smaller radius. Apart from the artillery base, you also have access to bombers. You can order these bombers to strike an area, with the pattern of their strikes being determined by each bomber. There's a lot more flexibility with bombers in comparison to the artillery base strikes, 
because you can angle, move, and adjust the strike area in pretty much whatever way you want. And different bombers will have different types of strikes. The KM-6 fighter bomber, for example, won't use explosives. It will shoot in the targeted area, making it relatively safe to shoot at your own position, as the bullets are unlikely to hit you. The Vesta bomber uses napalm, and you can use its wall of fire to damage and slow down enemies as they come towards you. The Phobos covers wide areas with high explosive bombs. And then there's the Spritefall. The Spritefall is my favorite airstrike. It is your favorite airstrike. Everybody loves the Spritefall. It's a high-powered satellite laser that suppresses an area for a good amount of time. It is so useful. Take a listen to the Spritefall lady. Output increased. Gun hatch opened. Shooting mode. Fire! Beam! The creator of this weapon must be a genius! That's me! I'm the one who built this satellite. Get burned by the fire of hell and die! <laughs> you have good taste, Air Raider. The Spritefall Lady has dialogue every time you shoot it, and in fact, all of these airstrikes have dialogue from the people shooting the actual guns whenever you use any of them. And the last thing that the Air Raider specializes in is vehicles. The Ranger also has access to some vehicles, but they're nowhere near as strong as what the Air Raider has access to. And the strongest vehicles you have access to are the Nyx Armored Exoskeletons. They also work off a credit system, and different vehicles have different uses. The blue ones will have a good balance of firepower and mobility. The green ones will usually have low mobility and terrible turn rates, but incredibly powerful weaponry and damage. And the red ones will have high mobility, a large jump distance, flamethrowers, and shotguns attached to the back. Like I said in the beginning, the Air Raider doesn't have a lot of movement options, and is worse off than a Ranger if it gets surrounded by enemies. But that's only if you don't count the vehicles. Some of the armored personnel carriers and some of the higher level mobility Nixes can cover impressive distances quickly. The Air Raider also has exploding Roombas he can shoot, auto turrets that he can place on the ground and activate, he can heal allies and vehicles, as well as increase those allies and vehicles' offense or defense. He has portable force field generators which create translucent walls that let you shoot out but enemies can't shoot into. He has a unique laser kit guide that will cause all locked-on type weaponry to target where you're pointing. So if a ranger has a missile launcher and he's shooting out his missiles, you can cause all of his missiles to hit the targets you want them to hit. The same thing happens if the Fencer or the Wing Diver is also using similar weaponry. In fact, the Fencer synergizes with the Air Raider because there's incredibly high-powered weapons that the Fencer has access to that can only be fired if an Air Raider is pointing their laser guide at something. The Air Raider also has a nuke. Now, some of the missions have the Air Raider at a disadvantage because they're underground or indoors. And in these cases, the air raider is at a disadvantage because he doesn't have access to his air raids, he doesn't have access to any of his artillery, he can't summon in any vehicles. But that's okay, because in these underground missions, you can still use your depth crawler. And that is more than enough. Because the depth crawler is strong. It can walk. It can dodge. And most importantly, you can put a decoy on it. All right, let's move on to talking about the Fencer. The Fencer has a powered exoskeleton, which lets it carry and use weapons that would normally need to be mounted on vehicles. They can equip up to four weapons at once, and it's the only class that can choose to equip the same weapon. So, for example, the Air Raider couldn't choose three of the same Air Raids. It would need to choose three different things. The Ranger similarly can't pick two of the same assault rifle. It could be the same type, but it couldn't be the exact same one. The Fencer will equip four weapons for a mission, but can only use two at once, essentially having two different loadouts that he can switch out freely. Essentially, there's three different types of weapons that the Fencer gets access to. The first one will let him zoom in, and those are typically long-range weapons. The second type will let him boost, which lets him jump very high into the air. And the third type will allow him to dash, which lets him quickly dodge in any direction. 
Now, if you equip a weapon that can boost in one hand and another weapon that can dash in the other hand, then this lets you do a dash jump. You dash and then you jump with the momentum of the dash propelling you forward. This lets you cover huge distances quickly. At first, the fencer can only do one dash and one jump, and those things will have a short cooldown, limiting how quickly and how far you can go. But you can mitigate and improve that because the fencer has two slots of support equipment. And some of the things you can equip in these slots are dash cells and boosters that let you increase the number of times you can dash or jump in succession. This gives the fencer a huge amount of mobility that the air raider and ranger couldn't even begin to try and have. The fencer also has access to long-range weaponry. But usually these weapons are heavy, they're modified tank guns designed for fencer use, which means that they'll have heavy recoil and a big impact on movement speed and inertia, with the strongest and heaviest versions pushing the fencer back slightly with each shot. Thankfully you can equip the muzzle stabilizers, which will reduce the recoil of these weapons, and different arm and leg stabilizers that reduce the weapon's impact on your movement speed and your rotational inertia. Finally, the fencer also has access to shields. When paired with a blast hole spear, you can keep the shield up while you're still attacking. All of the melee weapons are dash type weapons, and the shield doesn't let you boost, which means that when you're using a shield, you'll be limited to dashing on the ground. The shield will protect you from enemy attacks, but it'll also knock you back which could be useful for keeping you away from monsters. The shield with spear playstyle can be incredibly powerful and has its own category of support equipment, which does things like improve the shield's durability, increase the angle of defense for the shields, reduce the knockback of getting hit by enemy fire, and increases the damage reduction rate. As you can see, the fencer, like the ranger, has a lot of options on how to deal with things, and his different support equipment lets him specialize into whatever it is he's doing at the moment. If he wants massive mobility, he gets massive mobility. He can also forgo mobility entirely to be a DPS-focused stationary turret, or rush into the front lines as a tank. Now, the Wing Diver is the only female class and the one that I've played the least. What I do know is that her gimmick is energy management. The resource she uses to fly is the same resource that she'll use to recharge and fire her weapons. And if you exhaust her core, it will recharge more quickly than normal, but you'll also be helpless during that time. She seems to be a high DPS, high mobility class, but she also has the lowest armor and the highest potential for you to make mistakes and end up dying. Alright, now let's talk about loot. Because in a lot of ways, EDF is a very loot-oriented game. Anytime you kill an enemy, there is a chance one of four boxes will drop. The first two are health packs. The small white boxes heal about 15% of your total HP. And the large white boxes heal a third of your total HP. The other two boxes are the weapon and armor boxes. These are the boxes that you definitely want to pick up before the mission ends, because they represent permanent upgrades. Armor in EDF is actually just your health, and picking up armor boxes will increase the total amount of health you have available for future missions. The upgrade to health happens after the mission ends. The weapon boxes will have new weapons, which is important because there's over a thousand weapons between all four classes. Not every one of those weapons is incredibly unique, some of them are straight upgrades, but a surprising number of them are different, and will have at least one thing about them that makes them uniquely desirable or undesirable. What weapon gets unlocked is random, but the weapons possible to get are from a list that's dependent on what mission you're playing and the difficulty of that mission. What weapons you got and how much armor you got is revealed to you after the mission is over. Now, in online mode, it's always beneficial to get the red and green boxes. Because unlike the health boxes, these benefit every player regardless of who picks it up. If somebody else picks up a weapon box, everybody in that mission will get a new weapon. And if other people get armor boxes, you will benefit from the increased health. If you're playing online, it's everyone's responsibility to try and get all of the green boxes and try and get as many of the red boxes as possible. But if you're playing as a fencer or a wing diver, then you're playing with the classes with the most mobility. And so the lion's share of that responsibility will fall to you. The missions in EDF 5 can be very challenging, especially on the higher difficulties. And it can be difficult to find a substantially large lull period to go collecting weapon boxes. The biggest lull periods happen right before the mission ends. At those times, there usually will be some lengthy radio chatter giving story exposition, and you can use that opportunity to get as many boxes around you as possible. Now the weapons and armor that you get 
will benefit mostly the class that you're currently playing. About 50% of the armor and 50% of the new weapons you get will be for your current class, and the other 50% will be distributed among the other three classes you're not playing. This is so that the other classes don't become too weak in comparison to the main class that you're playing. The class that you're currently playing will always get the most stuff, but by distributing 50% of your unlocks to the other three classes, it reduces the cost of switching to one of those classes if you decide to. It's a good thing to try and get as many of the weapon boxes even during combat, because you'll get some of the loot even if you fail the mission, with the amount of loot you get depending on the difficulty of the mission that you're doing. There's five difficulty levels. On easy, you'll get 100% of the loot that you pick up whether you clear the mission or not. On normal, you'll get 75. On hard, you'll get 50%. On hardest, you'll get 25%. And on Inferno, the hardest difficulty, you will only get loot if you clear the mission. Okay, now here's where it gets a little weird. Every weapon can be upgraded. Every weapon has stats that's relevant to that weapon. So for example, damage, range, lock-on speed for missiles, blast radius, if it's for vehicles, the amount of credits required to summon those vehicles. And when you pick up a green box, it's possible that you'll get a weapon that you already have. You'll get a duplicate of a weapon that you've already gotten. And this version of the weapon will have randomized stats, which may be better or worse than the weapon that you're currently using. If the weapon that you pick up is better in any way, then that weapon's superior stats will be added to your weapon, upgrading it to that level. So if the rifle that you pick up has better range and better damage, then from then on, that version of the rifle that you're using will always have that better range and better damage. If you pick up a weapon that's worse than the weapon that you're using in every way, then nothing will happen. But as long as the new weapon has even one stat that's better than the one that you're currently using, then your weapon will upgrade to that level, becoming permanently better. In this way, it's beneficial even to get weapons that you've gotten before. These upgrades are automatic. If a weapon can accept an upgrade at the end of a mission, a green up appears, indicating that that weapon has been improved. When a stat has been upgraded fully, it will display that by showing a star. When every stat on a weapon is fully upgraded, and no more upgrading is possible, the star will appear next to its name in the weapon select menu. Now this is important because the difference between an unupgraded weapon and a fully upgraded weapon can be significant. But it also matters because of how the online multiplayer works. You see, every weapon has a weapon level. In general, the higher level a weapon, the stronger it is. Now this isn't always true, these weapons can be very different, and so sometimes you might choose to use a lower level weapon for whatever reason. Regardless, these levels only matter in the multiplayer. There is the offline mission mode, which is balanced for one person, you, and then there's the online mission mode, which is scaled to however many people are on the mission, unless it's one. If you play an online mission mode by yourself, it will scale as if there were four players. Now, if you're playing in the offline by yourself, you don't have to worry about weapon levels. This is something that only applies when you're playing with others. You see, when you play online missions, there's a weapon level limit. And that limit is based on what mission you're doing and the difficulty that you're doing that mission on. The weapon level limit means that you can only use weapons and equipment that are below that level. So if it's level 10, you look at the weapons that you have available, and you can only pick the ones that are below level 10. This is done for balancing purposes, as the weapons that you can get in the later levels and the higher difficulties are extremely powerful, and wouldn't let other players in the lobby have a balanced experience. So even if you're playing with randoms or with your friend, there's a limit to how overpowered you can be. There is also an armor limit, but it's less impactful. The first time I played through any given difficulty, the armor maximum was way higher than what I had available, so the armor limit never mattered. And because of this weapon level limit, the upgrades are very valuable. Because a mission level limit might be level 10, but there's no limits on how leveled up your weapon can be. I really like this weapon level limit system, because it allows experienced veteran players to play the same mission with people that are new, but doesn't let those veterans have access to their strongest weapons, which would trivialize the experience for both of them. The veterans get to be stronger and feel stronger because they have a wider access to different kinds of weapons, and those weapons are more likely to be either partially or fully upgraded, and it even makes that lower level loot that they're getting valuable. 
because that lower level loot is the only kind you can use in the earlier missions and easier difficulties. It's great, it's good for the new players because it restricts the veterans and tries to give them a more balanced experience, while still being fun and rewarding for people that have been playing for a long time. Alright, let's talk about the different difficulties now. At the beginning, you'll have access to the first three, Easy, Normal, and Hard. And you'll be able to access Hardest and Inferno after you clear the game once in any of those difficulties. In my opinion, Hard is the perfect difficulty. Even for a first playthrough, especially if you're playing online with other people. Hard, I feel, provides the perfect level of challenge. For the most part, you'll be able to go from one mission to the next without too much trouble. It'll often be rough, but very doable. However, the tougher missions might get you stuck a bit. But I consider this a positive, because in these situations, if you're playing with other people, you can strategize. It's a good thing to lose and then have to take a look at the equipment you have available and think, how am I going to deal with the bullshit that this specific mission is throwing at me? In my opinion, the more times that happens in a playthrough, the better. And the hard difficulty provides the sweet spot that lets that scenario happen enough times to be satisfying, but not so many times that it's overwhelming. After you clear your first playthrough, you'll have access to Hardest and Inferno. And if you like the game enough to take on those difficulties, then there's still more content for you. Because the weapons that you can get are based on both mission and difficulty. And the weapons that you can get on the higher difficulties are really strong. They have to be because of the amount of bullshit the game will throw at you at those difficulties. I recommend that if you're going to tackle those difficulties, for you to do Hardest and then Inferno. A playthrough through Hardest will get you the new weapons and more opportunities to get more armor that you're going to need to tackle the Hardest difficulty. Because the Hardest difficulty, Inferno, is ridiculous. It is the stupidest shit you've ever seen. The first time I played EDF5, I went from clearing hard straight into tackling Inferno, and I do not recommend it. I do not recommend this course. I played this difficulty with a friend, and together we had to organize our lives around beating this difficulty. We both had jobs and busy lives, so we had to organize to get up four hours earlier than normal, so that we can have this three-hour uninterrupted slice of time to play this game. Every day at 5 a.m., we're calling each other to make sure they're getting on, so we can slog through mission after brutal mission. Remember that thing that I said about getting stuck on a mission and having to strategize and plan out with your friend? Well, Inferno had us doing plenty of that. It was like that every third mission. When I was talking about that as a positive, I meant, like, that happens every once in a while you get stuck on a mission. But on Inferno, it happens all the time and our three-hour session of playtime is filled entirely in just beating that one mission. And because we went from Hard to Inferno without clearing the missions multiple times, we spent the entire time having less than a thousand health, which I only realized how unusual it was when we got someone else joining in on a mission. The randoms that were joining on Inferno had 2,000, 4,000 HP, or whatever the maximum HP possible was for that mission. We were not prepared. Towards the end of the game, the missions get much harder. And so getting stuck wasn't an occurrence that happened every three missions. It was an occurrence that happened every single mission towards the end. Just session after session of beating one or two missions at a time. EDF5 on Inferno was probably the most frustrating experience I've had in video games. It was also one of the most fun. I look back on those sessions fondly. And I have every intention of doing the same thing again when EDF6 gets its English release sometime this spring. Alright, the last thing I want to talk about is the story. Pretty much all of the EDF videos I've seen talk about the same things. The emphasis is always on how wild everything is, how cheesy the dialogue is, how many giant insects are on the screen at once, how big the explosions can get, and the fun of friendly fire with your friends. And... Don't get me wrong, that's important. Those are important things. Those are probably the most important things. For many, those are the only things that matter. But not for me. My favorite thing about EDF is the story. I think Earth Defense Force 5 displays masterful storytelling, and I'm sad that this aspect never gets advertised in any videos. EDF is about more than just violence and explosions. Its narrative can be silly, 
but it's also very grim and strangely hopeful. And the context it provides makes the violence and the explosions more meaningful. The gameplay gets incorporated into the narrative in a way that elevates both. Like I said before, the story of EDF5 is told mainly through NPC dialogue. Radio chatter, conversations between NPCs, and news reports. The writing is famously cheesy. It's over the top. But its saving grace is that it always takes itself seriously. The lines may be cheesy, but the delivery isn't. It's not trying to parody or poke fun at itself. There's no, well that just happened, kind of lines. It doesn't break character, and that lets me take it at face value. It lets me get invested in the story. It's not being overly self-aware. And as a result, I don't detect that there's anything out of place when the story goes from being funny to grim. One moment you're enjoying the gameplay in your anime waifu spider tank, and then in the next moment you hear a transmission that's so well done it's downright moving. Everyone else is dead. And we are alive. We, the living, have to fight. We will fight in the name of our planet and stick it to them! I think this works because EDF is consistent. It always delivers each line with the same seriousness. Because so much of the focus is on the gameplay, you're likely not to notice a lot of what's being said. But most people will notice eventually. And when you do, you have the choice to allow yourself to be swept up in the atmosphere EDF5 is constantly trying to build. You don't have to. But if you do, you'll see that even the fun gameplay you've been enjoying exists in service to the atmosphere. Do you remember the mission I described early in the video, where the pylons crash down and they force you to retreat? I like that moment because the whole game really is just that. The radio chatter does a great job of telling you how poorly things are going in the war. It tells you how badly you're losing in every front. But that dialogue, for me, increases in effectiveness because the gameplay reinforces it. EDF is not an easy game, and seeing those pylons crash down has an effect because you know the effort to take down one. The narrative and the gameplay work in tandem to make you feel overwhelmed. The story dangles a bit of hope only to take it away. And each time they do, they top themselves with more spectacle and do it in a bigger scale. That's not to say the game has you only losing throughout the story the EDF learns. It has major wins sometimes. But the wins come at a cost, and they're always permeated with failure. And that's because the theme of this game is about losing. It's about a desperate struggle to survive as the human population dwindles, and the situation gets more and more desperate. We try to attack the mothership, but they deploy their humanoid soldiers, and we barely survive. We try to destroy their underground nest, but underestimate how many bugs were there, and are forced to retreat. We try and kill not Godzilla, and like everything else, it just doesn't work. My favorite of these moments is the alien base. I put a spoiler warning before I started talking about the story, but this is a particularly excellent moment, so don't watch or listen to this if you've already been convinced and have decided you're going to play the game. There's a point where you try and assault an alien base. You fight off waves of insects and drones, and as you get closer, it opens fire with more and more cannons. Until finally it opens fire with everything. It looks like a scene out of hell. You did not know what you were messing with, and you are forced to retreat. And then many missions pass. You get victories under your belt. You even manage to destroy the underground nest. And so finally you come back better prepared. You attack under the cover of a sandstorm. You make it to the base. You're about to blow it up. And then it stands the fuck up. It chases you across the map, crushing your allies as it goes, deploying wave after wave of enemies. You're forced to fall back from point to point. If you don't stick to the NPCs, you risk getting surrounded and overwhelmed by the constantly deployed enemies. The radio chatter guides you to a line of heavy tanks that will serve as a final line of defense. They open fire, giving you some breathing room. All of the remaining EDF units converge here. The base opens fire with dozens of cannons it had hidden in its underbelly. Nothing works. The enemies keep coming. You're completely drained. The mission has been going on for a while. The circle of NPCs around you gets smaller and smaller. The city you were in when the mission started has been flattened. You wonder if you're expected to destroy all the cannons under the base while dealing with so much. When the attack fails and a retreat is ordered, you feel nothing but relief. I love that mission. And moments like these, peppered with news and radio chatter to drive home the context, is what makes EDF so great. It's one of those rare games where the gameplay, the narrative, the atmosphere, and the theme are all in agreement, 
with what they're trying to accomplish. It's a pro-human message. It's about trying to find a way out of a clearly hopeless situation. It's about the courage and nobility of the human spirit, even as the noose tightens around your neck. And that theme is reinforced in every detail. When you first start the game, you're often fighting in city centers with fleeing civilians. But as the war proceeds, the cities and towns become empty. And in the later missions, there's barely any left. You're fighting in a war-torn wasteland. Even the EDF song exemplifies this idea. The song starts off normal and positive, but just like the game, the song goes from cheery to dark. I know that at the end of the day, most people who like Earth Defense Force like it because of the gameplay is fun, or because it's a fantastic game to play with your friends. And that's true, it is. I played blind with a friend, and it's some of the most fun I've had playing a co-op game. But I also think EDF has more to it than that. I think that it doesn't just have a good story, I think it has a great story that just happens to be told in a non-traditional way. But I think the game uses that to its advantage. Even the Philistines that typically don't care about story, I suspect will be at least a little moved by the end of the game. EDF has a cult following, and I think that it's not just because it's hard, it's not just because it's fun or funny, it's because the atmosphere it cultivates is phenomenal. That's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching. Yet you still hide